Um, why don't we go ahead and start? Um, so welcome, and I want to thank you guys for volunteering. I really appreciate it. I think this is going to be a super fun project, and we'll iron out all the kinks as we go. So, um, but thank you for coming, and thank you for volunteering. I really appreciate it. Um, I think everybody on here has signed up for a, uh, a loop, or not a loop, I'm getting the, the names wrong, a site. Um, but if you happen to want another site, or if there's someone who doesn't have a site, I think you all do, so I don't need to say this. But anyway, there's one or two left open. I'll be doing those. So don't worry about it. It'll get done. But if you know someone who still wants one, we still have one or two left. Um, okay, so I, I wanted to have this meeting because it's kind of a big project, and I had gotten lots of questions from people. And I just wanted to make sure we answered all those questions. Um, so I'm going to go over a couple of things and then just open the, open the floor to, to questions. So does that sound good to everyone? Yes. OK. Um, so the way that we're going to implement this in our chapter, so other chapters do it different ways, but the way we've decided to do it in our chapter is we've picked a site coordinator for each site, so that's you all. Um, and then that site coordinator will be in charge of scheduling the visits and completing the checklist and sending the checklist to me. Um, I will be, I'm the coordinator for the, the, the whole project to the Department of Wildlife Resources. And I will be collecting all the information from you guys and sending that up to the biologists at, the, at DWR. Um, so, so that's, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, what you need to do for each visit, um, I, so there, there's, I hope you all had a chance to look at some of the links I sent. I know there's a lot of, there were a lot of those links. So if you haven't had a chance, feel free to look at them afterwards, but there's a, um, there's a pretty good description on, I think it's, they have like a slideshow of instructions of what to do at each visit. So I'm just gonna kind of go through what each visit's gonna look like and what your responsibilities are for that. So before the visit, you should visit the DWR website for your particular site. So you would go to the Birding and Wildlife Trail and you know, negotiate through the menus to, or do a search for your site. Um, and you want to print out, you know, the description that's there for your site and bring that with you to your site visit. Um, also, while you're doing, you know, getting ready for your site visit, um, you'll need to print out the checklist. And if you want to print out a window sign to put in your car, that's, you know, if you feel like you need it. Um, and then, so, so that's, before the visit. And then while you're at the visit, um, I've got the checklist right here in front of me. And basically there's a couple of sections. You're gonna be looking at, the first section is um, confirming that the Virginia Birding and Wildlife Trail signs are present. So there's several questions about signage. That's, those are those brown signs you see. Um, so there's that. And then the next set of questions is about um, the information that's on the website. So this is where that printout that you made of your site comes in handy. What you'll want to do, especially at the first visit or two, is make sure that the information on the website matches what's actually there. Make sure the address is right, the directions are right, whatever descriptions of the trails or amenities, all of that. So that's the second set of questions on your checklist. Um, the third set, like, so I'm, I'm just going through the checklist. Number three, so it, the third kind of area on the checklist is the site uh -huh. contact. Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I was talking to my cat, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Does he listen? Um, okay, so the, so number three on the, the checklist um, talks about site contact. So I'm going to leave that for later because um, I want to talk about that later. 
So just skip that part on site contact for, for right now. And then the fourth, let's see, the number four, the item number four on the checklist talks about public access. And that's, you know, can you still park there? Are there no trespassing signs, whatever? So, so there's an area there to add that. And then after that, it talks about um, birding observations, make sure that you're using eBird. And then the other thing is wildlife mapping and making sure that you're using iNaturalist. So at each site visit, you're gonna go through this checklist, answer the questions, and then do the birding observations and the wildlife mapping. So that's kind of the, the, the big view of it, but um, I'm, I'm gonna, I know that's, that's a lot and it's really fast, but you guys probably already have some questions. So hit me with what, what you got, what can I clarify that's on this visit checklist? So I have a question. Go right ahead. And you and I have been talking about this, but uh -huh. I don't think at Mountain Lake, I'm going to have access on my phone to use the app. So I guess that's just figuring out how to do it when I get home. Yeah. You, um, go ahead. Someone else. Well, I was just going to, I was just going to say that for iNaturalist, if you make an observation and you're not uh, within Wi-Fi or you don't have service, it will all sync when you get into service. So you make your observations as best you can and don't like write them down and, and then go home and try to enter them. Take the picture and then you can share it when you get in, when you have service. And it's okay. the same thing with eBird. You can make your list and, and it'll take your, it'll make, let you make a list. Okay, and that's then, fine. And then it'll yeah. sync when you get in when you get into a service area. Okay. And of course, what yeah, I can go more than you know, it'll be hit or miss. Um could be hit or miss, and I can go back because I'll be up there enough to yes, you can't it, it won't let you if you don't have service and you don't know what you're looking at, you you can't like vet your, if you say, what am I looking at? And it'll give you suggestions. It, it won't give you the suggestions when you're out of service, but you could take the picture. Mm -hmm. And you could take the picture on iNaturalist. Will, will it place the observation at the GPS? I think it does because mm -hmm. GPS doesn't require Wi-Fi okay. or any or cellular. Okay, good. I didn't know. satellite. And Sandy, just so you'll know, also, uh, Mara's been helping me with this because I really prefer to use Seek. Mm -hmm. and because Seek, because uh, why? Excuse me? You said Mara's been helping you because? Mara's been, we've just been talking about this. I prefer to use Seek. And so she's been helping me um, post it to iNaturalist okay. because Seek will work without the internet connection. And it, you know, so I, I'm still working through that. Um, I'm still working through that, but. Um, so, so just so everybody knows, um, there are two apps that you can put on your phone. Um, and also iNaturalist is a separate standalone website you can, do it from your home computer. So the, the iNaturalist app will allow you to upload a picture and you tell it, or you make a suggestion, I think this is whatever. And then other people comment and say, yes, it is whatever thing you identified it as, or it's not. But um, the, the other app is called Seek, S-E-E-K. I don't know if you all have used it, but Seek is also, made by iNaturalist and you can sign into your iNaturalist account using Seek. And so what Seek does is uh, you hold your phone up to a plant or 
insect, whatever, any, you know, it'll do animals and anything like that. Um, and it will, given enough time, it will um, suggest to you what it thinks that plant is. After you take the picture, if you scroll up a little bit, you have an option to post that to iNaturalist. So in this way, you can be using Seek and then post to iNaturalist. If you'd rather, you can just do it all from the iNaturalist app, or you can take the pictures and then later upload them onto your computer and do it all from your computer at home. So I, I personally find using Seek pretty easy. I know other people use iNaturalist more. Um, I have used the computer to update things, upload pictures. I find it a little more time consuming that way, but all of those methods work. Um, one thing I did want to bring up um, in iNaturalist, I'm hoping you all have a, an iNaturalist account. If not, you'll want to sign up for one. Um, I was going around just taking pictures, assuming that my, my things posting to iNaturalist would post to this project. But when I was going through all of the paperwork today, I realized that you have to do one other step, which is on, on iNaturalist, you need to join the project. So the project is called, um, here, I've got my notes here, Virginia Wildlife Mapping. So if, um, if you remember, I sent a link to the, the BMN page that had all these things. There's something about wildlife mapping and it tells you how to join this project. So you have to go on iNaturalist, either through your app or through the website and join the project, Virginia Wildlife Mapping. And that way your observations uh, are, are set aside, the DWR can see them associated with this project. And once, let me just comment that yes. once mm -hmm. you join a project, you don't have to tag in any way, you don't have to tag each observation. If it meets the requirements, like say, well, Barb Walker and I are gonna do Glen Alton. When we are at Glen Alton, if we put something into iNaturalist and we've already joined the Virginia Birding and Wildlife Trail project, we don't have to do anything special for each observation. It automatically goes to that project. It's the same thing with Falls Ridge. If you join the Falls Ridge project, any observation you make on iNaturalist within the Falls Ridge mapping area just goes into that project. You don't have to tag it in any way. Right, and it's it's not the kind of thing you have to do more than once. You only right. have to do it once. One time. So next time you open up the website or your app, search for Virginia Wildlife Mapping, join it, and then you can forget about it. It, it'll, it'll automatically, any um, observations you take that are appropriate for that um, project, it will connect them. So that was something I, I I'm just learning about myself. So um, let me know if you have any questions about how to find that project. But it, as I said, there's a whole page of information um, on that VMN website, it's called um, Wildlife Mapping and it kind of describes how to join the project. But you, you can probably figure it out just by going to the, the website, but it does have step-by-step. Step. So, um, go ahead. Mara, so that means that probably the things that I already found, I'll have to go back and find them again, that I won't be able to, maybe there's a way to do it retroactively and I won't worry about that, but I yeah. got so excited that I went up there and snapped. Yeah, yeah, as I said, I'm just learning this too, so I, I didn't realize it either. But um, this is a long-term project, so whatever you know what I mean. Don't yeah, worry about I, it if I'm you've missed worried. a few. Yeah, half the fun is learning how to do what we need to do. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and the other thing I was going to offer, and I don't know if if you all are interested in this or want this, um, if anybody would like kind of a, a crash course on how to use iNaturalist or eBird or both. Um, I'm happy to set up like an in-person, we'll meet at Pandapus and, and kind of all walk through how to use the app. So send me a message, send me an email, put it in the chat room or whatever. Let me know if you're interested and I can set that up. But if you don't need that, that's great, but I'm happy to do it um, if that will help people as we get started. 
So one more question. Yeah. Um, with eBird, do you have to join the project for them to find that information? As far as I understand, from what I've read today and from you know looking at all the stuff, as long as the the site that you're at has an eBird hotspot, which I know Mountain Lake does. I, I think almost all of these sites do have eBird hotspots. As long as you're using that, um, you know, then it will, you don't need to join anything. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. eBird's been around a long time. Yeah, yeah. Oh. So hopefully that, that will go smooth. So as I said, if you want help with the app, if you want just five minutes, I can show you how to use it. Or, or Reinhardt's very good at using eBird. He can show you how to use eBird. So we can set that up if needed. Just want to throw that out there. Um, okay, so as far as, um, so, so I kind of went over the checklist and what to do each time. Let's talk about the site contact, because that was something I said I wanted to talk about later. So the, the number three item on the, on the checklist has to do with the site contact. And this, this relates to the landowner, basically. Um, and this is not something that has to be done every time. They suggest you do it once a year. I'm, I'm fine with that. Maybe even every other year. It, it's not really going to change much, I don't expect. Um, but because we have two loops and because we have um, multiple uh, sites that may belong to the same landowner, I think it kind of makes sense for us to say, okay, all the Forest Service ones, I'll do those. All the City of Radford ones, somebody else will do those. So I would like to just suggest that for the next visit, like they say that you're supposed to visit four times a year, don't worry about the site contact. I'm gonna kind of go through and figure out how many that we have that belong to the same landowner. And then we can kind of divide up the work so that we don't wanna have three different people calling the forest service about the same type of issue. Does that make sense? Yeah. So for, for now, just skip that part. And I will um, over the next month or two kind of try to figure out how many people need to be doing this and, and I'll be in touch about that. But for now, just skip the site contact part of it. Um, when I spoke with um, Megan, the, the DWR biologist, I spoke to her about a week ago, um, a couple of things she clarified for me. She said that in the first year, because this trail hasn't really been monitored or adopted yet, um, they kind of expect that there'll be a lot of things like, oh, there was no sign or, oh, this site has changed or, you know, so the first year is kind of, kind of making sure that what's on the website and the signage kind of matches what is actually there. So after that part is done, it's really, you know, you're going to show up and you're going to be like, oh yeah, signs there, just like it was last time, you know, trails there just like it was last time. So, so the first year, the first couple of visits, there's gonna be a lot of, oh, this isn't right, that isn't right. But after those corrections are made, that'll be just sort of a check, 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 and go do the wildlife mapping and the, the e-birding. So, so then it'll, it'll kind of evolve like that. So the first couple of visits may take a little longer because we're doing all that. Um, also in the first year, she said, if there are any sites that need to be removed, um, you know, we can make those suggestions or, you know, modified if we need to modify the, the text that's on the website, we can make those suggestions. And then she said, as we go forward, if we have suggestions for other wildlife spots, other wildlife viewing spots that we know of that we want to add, we can kind of do that. But the first priority is to kind of um, make sure that what's on the, on the loop all the different sites, make sure those sites are kind of accurately described and adequately signed and, and all that. So does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so probably the first visit or two might, you know, just take a little bit longer, a little bit more writing on the, on the checklist, that kind of thing. 
But after that, it's going to be kind of, you know, um, walk in the park type mm -hmm. thing. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, also, the checklist is like a three-page PDF. And I was able to um, download it to my computer and open it in Word. So you're welcome to just write on it, scan it in, and send me your handwritten stuff. That's fine. Um, some people prefer to type. So if you want to take all your notes home and type it up later as a Word file and then send me that file, that's fine too. Um, yeah. So does anyone have a question about the checklist? Have you all had a chance to look at it or briefly? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. I think, I mean, I don't have too much more to go over. Do, do you guys, what, what feedback do you have for me about, um, about the project and about what you'll be doing and all that? I think you answered my question. What Barb and I were wondering left? about the forest service issue because so many people have forest service things. So the fact that you already under, you know, are gonna figure out how we'll contact the forest service about the multiple sites, right. that's good. We'll wait on that. Do you have a plan for when you want us um, to go? I haven't, yeah, as I said, I'm planning to do that kind of in the next month or two to try to get that list together and then figure out who's gonna make the contacts and so just don't worry about it for right now. I just, I haven't had a chance to, to really dig into it just yet. Um, I, have, I have another question about the site contacts. Okay, mm -hmm. Mountain Lake, that's gonna be different than, you know, a bunch of different forest service properties. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking that, that <clears throat> Jerry Vaya can tell me who would be the best person to talk to up there. Sure. And that, I probably need to sort of develop a relationship with this person so that they know what I'm doing and why I'm doing it because I wouldn't want to submit information. You know, for example, what if the sign is there but the signpost has fallen over? I would mm -hmm. think that before I report that to DWR, that somebody at Mountain Lake would put that sign back up or that, you know, I could kind of talk over my observations with them. Yeah. I think you have kind of a unique one because it is privately owned. I don't think there are very many that are like that. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have a problem with it. If you would like to go ahead and do that. The, on the checklist, it's got like a little script about, you know, hi, I'm doing this because of this. And I'd like to talk to you about this. You know, so it sort of has a little bit of, here's how to go about, you know, getting in touch with this person and what items you need to discuss. Um, so if, if any of you all would like to just go ahead and contact, like Lucinda, if you'd like to, just let me know so I make sure that I'm not, you know, double doing any. But I think yours, Lucinda, I can't think of any others that are, are kind of not more publicly owned. If that makes sense. I'll have to talk to the people at Glen Lynn because that's actually owned by the Army Corps of Engineers. Okay. At least yeah. to the town for, I don't know, 100 years, something like that. Yeah. And I don't think, yeah, I don't think we have any others like that. So, anyway, so, so the site contact, I'm happy to let that go for the next month or two. And then I'll kind of dig into who owns what and, and what we need to do about it. But if you'd like to go ahead and, and do that, just let me know that you're doing that and that's fine. Um, uh, one thing I did wanna talk about, um, uh, I would like it if you could at least, at least some of the time, invite others to come along with you. So I, I think it's the kind of project where you really wanna have more than one set of eyes. Mm -hmm. If you have a, a couple of chapter members you'd like to just invite along, that's okay sometimes, but I would like that um, other chapter members would, could get the opportunity to come along with you at least some of the time. Now I know that you know you might schedule something last minute and may not be able to, but what the way I'm thinking it would work is um, say you look at your calendar and say, okay, well 
two Saturdays from now, I can go out and do um, my site visit. Then you could send Sandy an email because Sandy does our calendar. And in the next calendar, she could put a little blurb in saying, um, Dave McEwen is gonna visit his site on, at Virginia Tech on this Saturday with a rain date of this. And if you wanna go, email Dave and here's his email. So I, I think that's probably the easiest way to do it is to get it added to the calendar. Um, if, if you all have, you know, you could do like a sign up genius or something. I don't think that's really necessary. So I, I think that just, um, you know, letting Sandy know at least a week ahead of time and that way other people could join. And you, you're welcome to say, you know, I only want a couple people or I'm looking for, you know, someone mentioned, oh, I need someone who could help me out with birding. So you could even say in your, in your blurb, you know, I'd like to have two or three people join me, or you could say, I'd really like to have someone who's good at birding join me, or maybe someone who's really familiar with these wildlife or I mean, um, wildflowers, that kind of thing. So does that make sense to you all? Do you feel comfortable doing that? Okay. So as I said, it doesn't have to be every time, um, you know, if you decide at the last minute one day, you're going to just do it. That's fine. I don't, I don't have a problem with it. Um, I do think that having more than one person would be helpful, but um, I'm kind of leaving it up to you to, to schedule it when it's convenient for you and to invite people when that works for you. So I, I think that um, our other members who may not have wanted to, you know, sign up to be in charge of a site are still going to want to come along and, and, and I think it's going to be a, a, a fun project to get together with others. Um, you know, in, in normal times, I would say, oh, let's carpool. Um, and I guess maybe we're getting back to that now, but you're welcome to just meet people if there's enough parking. So however it works for you, I'm just gonna leave that up to each of you to, to work out. So, what, so once you've signed up for the project, which I just did, it was easy. It was a choice already mm -hmm. in iNaturalist. Mm -hmm. Then anywhere you go, where that project is in place, whatever you make as an observation will go into that project. Right, and I think that's kind of cool because it I is. go to some of these sites multiple times, like I'm at Heritage Park, Deerfield, you know, I'm at all these places. And so that kind of makes it interesting because then anytime I'm there and I snap a photo of a wildflower or whatever, um, it can be added to iNaturalist. So it doesn't have to be just, you know, on an official site visit. So yeah, I think that's kind of cool. All right, I have a question. Is it okay to invite, it would be okay to also invite people who aren't master naturalists to come on the walk as well? Yeah, I think so. Um, uh, let's see. I, I wouldn't invite <laughs> sort of, yeah, I wouldn't invite kind of the general public, but somebody you know, I think would be fine. But um, I think, I don't know, Barb, what did we do with the, um, the hikes? Remember, we had some kind of well, yeah, we had we had a, a little release, but okay. it was pretty simple. Okay. That really didn't mean anything, I don't think. But yeah, so so at this other project where we had allowed people to invite people who are not naturalists, we had like a little paper form someone could sign saying, you know, just a release form. Um, you know, I, I think we did not do that. Do I, we think not? That, I, I think we, we checked on it and we did, it wasn't necessary. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So yeah, I think, you know, use your judgment. I think it's fine. I, I wouldn't, you know, go advertising it in the paper, but I think if you want to just ask a friend or go with a, a spouse or family member, whatever, it's fine. I don't Well, there's a, there's a small hiking group at my there's church. Just... I was thinking about maybe asking if, if some of them wanted to come. On mm -hmm. the... Yeah. I, I think I, I don't have a problem with that. Okay. I say, just make sure you mention the, the next training class. <laughs> yeah, that's so, right. So they, so they know who the master is. Yeah. Whatever uh, that what might be. are unadopted. Okay, so there's yes. a couple of sites. Um, the New River Trail is unadopted, but I'm, I'm kind of thinking that's my trail because I like going there. But if anybody wants it, I'm happy to, to give it up or share. Um, there is a, we're, I'm kind of 
been negotiating or we've been talking with um, the, the DWR biologists about the paddle sites. And so those aren't really assigned, but we're not sure how many we're keeping. Um, it was my personal suggestion that if I'm negotiating a river and there's white water, I'm not going to be, you know, e-birding or i-naturalisting. <laughs> you know, so exactly. I, I just think that um, so so some of those sites might go away because I think they're a little too challenging to look at wildlife while you're negotiating the river. But some of those are going to stay. So the paddle sites, I'm not sure what's going to happen with them, and I, I might take one anyway. So. So there's that. Um, and then there's also one other site where I had someone say, maybe chew. And so that one, I'm kind of hoping that's gonna work out, but it, it might not. So um, we'll just see what happens with that. I'm gonna, that's just a tentative one. I'm just not really sure yet. So, so they're mostly- So you have all the, the paddle site covered? Good. Judy, I didn't quite hear you. What's, what's not spoken for? Um, the, the one that I'm not sure about is Pandavas Pond. I had gotten kind of a maybe about that one. So that one, if, if that person decides not to do it, then that will be open. Um, the other sites that are open are New River Trail, which I'll probably do if nobody else wants, and also the paddle sites. Um, Jean Elliott is gonna do one and I might do another if, if we, just depending on how many they keep. So really, there's not really very many open unless someone wants to, to share your river trail with me, so. I will. Okay, okay. Yeah, I love going there and um, yeah, that, that we can talk about that. Yeah. We were so, thinking biking, biking and biking and checking would be kind of fun. Yeah, yeah. Doing that on bikes might be kind of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Reinhard and I have gotten in the habit of when we go there, we bring our binos and, you know, we'll bike for a while and stop and take a break and, and look for birds and things. And yeah, it's fun. Yeah. I, I have a question. I actually, I don't know if you know, I got to, my cat disconnected me for a while. Oh, um, <laughs> um, you know, I, I wonder what the, the emphasis about eBird and iNaturalist, for example, Barb and I are doing Glen Alton. I mean, people bird there and eBird there all the time. I, mm -hmm. I, I don't see that that's really the focus. I mean, it, would it will make it fun for us mm -hmm. to go out and do observation, but I think what DWR really wants is to make sure that their website is accurate, that people from the Tidewater don't drive all the way to Glen Alton and then find that it there's no parking or the bag right. expected to be there isn't open or whatever. So, I mean, I I don't know that the emphasis that eBird and iNaturalist are the biggest part of this project. Right. So I think I, I think you're you're absolutely right. And I have traveled and used. Um, birding and wildlife trails from other states. And believe me, I get to one of these sites and if it's not the way that it's described, I'm a little like, huh, why'd they send me here? You know? So mm -hmm. yes, I think it's very important that we get the, the description right, the signage right, all of that. But I, I think the, the way they're using eBird and iNaturalist is to kind of let people know um, this is what you're gonna find there. Um, she mentioned that a lot of birders, um, they, they want to see a site that has a lot of observations because they'll go, oh, that's a really good place to go. Oh, yeah. Okay. You know, so, so I think that's why, I, I, I do think all of the pieces are important. Um, I find, you know, using eBird and iNaturalist to be fun, as you said. It's right. like, you know, you're kind of seeing how many birds you can see or how many cool plants you can see or, you know, animals, all that. So, so yeah, I think that's kind of the fun part, but you're right, absolutely right, that the important part, or a very important part, is making sure that the description is right. And I think um, one thing that Megan mentioned to me, she said that if um, there's not enough room on the checklist, you're welcome to attach a separate page, like if you have suggestions or, or if you, I think if you open it in Word, it'll probably just expand as much as you need, so that there's that. But um, 
she and I were talking about, you know, making sure that the descriptions on the, the website kind of match what's actually there. So if there's a trail that's mentioned that's not there, you know, so, so I think that, you know, having that printout with you when you go, especially for the first visit, um, and you're welcome to make notes and say, oh, mention this, mention that, oh, they put in a, you know, a, um, uh, a restroom or, or whatever, you know, whatever amenities are there. We don't have the ability to directly write onto their website, but they will fix the website based on our input. Does that make sense? So um, I think as complete as we can be and, you know, using what's, you know, using the printout that we have and comparing to what's there and then making suggestions of how to change that so that it matches up with reality. Um, I, I do think that's very important. And that's really where, you know, we, especially for the first few visits, we want to make sure that 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 is something that we get right. So. Getting back to that e-birding. The use of e-bird. But getting okay. back to e-birding, anyone who is on, like say Glen Alton, which is heavily visited by the bird club, anyone who, I mean, you don't have to sign up for a project. Mm -hmm. So anyone who, who uh, is in that location and enters yeah. a list, that, that's available for the DWR to put on their website. Sure. And I think that we have several sites on our, on our two loops that are heavily birded. But then there are also several that are not, you know, there are several trails that are, uh, Warspur I think is not very heavily birded because people don't go there that much. And there's a Dismal Falls on, is on one of the loops and that one does, you know, very few people go there. So, so I do think while we do have sites that are heavily birded, not every site is. So I think, you know, having one person in charge of going four times a year to, to put an eBird list, that'll make a big difference at a place that doesn't have a lot of lists. But at a place that already has a lot of lists, you know, it's nice, but it's not, you know, it, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to make a real big impact on those uh, sites that aren't visited very often. So one thing, um, so I haven't looked at that 35 page presentation that you sent, but I guess what I've been envisioning all along is that this is not going to, this is going to be a web resource by DWR from now on, and it's going to be similar to the old books, but not identical. And so if I give them a list for each trail of, you know, 15 or 20 you know, let's say I do 15 or 20 of the most unusual wildflowers, okay, <laughs> instead of, you know, random stuff that you might see anywhere, yeah. and the most interesting birds, then they're going to start to repopulate uh, the information with the current sightings. Yeah. Um, and of course, plenty of people who might use this resource uh, would be unfamiliar with iNaturalist and they might not use eBird, you know, not everybody wants to do all those things, but, you know, generalists might be interested in what the wildflowers were, you know, yellow yeah. lady slippers. Yeah. Yeah. They go, oh, wow, I'd like to go see that. Yeah. And is that the reason to do it four times a year, the idea of doing it four times a year is to kind of capture the seasons. Yeah, that is, that is the idea. Um, and, you know, you, I think that from what I've seen, the, the sites that I've looked at um, on their, on their website, you're right. They're not producing a book anymore. They used to have a, a book that they produced. They don't do that anymore. Um, but I think on each description, from what I remember, you know, it kind of has some highlights. Oh, you can see these flowers here in the spring and these flowers here, or th these birds come through or whatever. So I, in the description, they do put a few notes about what's there wildlife wise. One thing I wanted to bring up, um, and I think it's addressed in one of the 
FAQs or, or something. But if you have a site that has multiple trails, you don't have to feel obligated to do every trail each time. They give us a little bit of um, leeway how we want to handle it. So you could either rotate through the trail. So this time I'm going to do this trail, this time I'm going to do that trail, however that works. Um, or you could just like if the if there's like one particular trail that everybody goes to, you could just concentrate on that. So I guess what I'm wanting to say is for those of you who have sites that have multiple trails, I'm gonna leave it up to your judgment how you wanna handle it. Either rotate through them, just hit the highlights of the most popular one, whatever you think is most appropriate for that site. Um, does that make sense? Do you guys have questions yeah. about that? Yep. So I'm, I'm trying to leave it pretty open for you to, um, you know, make decisions about what works for your site and, and to make sure that you, you have the ability to, to do those things. But if you have questions about it, I, I'm happy to answer them. Or, you know, if there's a specific question about your site, I can um, talk to Megan about it. Just send me an email and let me know. Um, so the, I think somewhere on here, they, they want, uh, here it is. They have the, the data collections divided by into four seasons, basically April to the end of June, July to the end of September, October to December, and then January through March 31st. So what I'm gonna say is anytime you wanna do your visit and send me your checklist, during that time, um, send it on. You don't have to wait for a certain date. Um, if I haven't heard from you by the end of that session, I might, you know, like two weeks before the end of it say, oh, have you done your visit? Send me your things. Um, but it's not, th there is some flexibility. So there's that. But um, just send it, send me your checklist after you do it. You don't have to wait till a certain day. And I will send all of the checklists to her probably four times a year. So she's not inundated constantly with a new one here and there. So, um, Let's see. So I think that um, if there are any other topics that you guys want to bring up, any other questions? Um, I, I may do another Zoom meeting for the site coordinators after we get going, maybe for six months, so we can talk about, hey, how's this project working for us? What do we want to do? Is there something we want to do differently? So I might schedule another Zoom meeting down the road. But um, other than that, you'll just be up, it'll just be up to you to schedule the site visit, to get it on the calendar with Sandy ahead of time, which you can, um, and to fill out the um, checklist and send it on to me. Um, um, I just want to yeah. make a, a comment. I, I just now signed up for the project um, on the DWR site, and I thought oh. I read somewhere that they're only interested in animals on the iNaturalist. I thought it said they only are posting for themselves rare reptiles and amphibians. So I don't know if that means just in that arena. I read that too. I, I read I read something. I'm looking I'm looking for it now, but I can't find it. Was it was in the agreement part. It's in gone. In the agreement, in the agreement part, it said um, we're only interested in in uh, members of the order Animalia. Hmm. Okay, I will I will clarify that and let you know because that's something I didn't know about. I thought they were interested in everything. So and I'm looking at their observations page of all the different species that have been observed in part of this project. And, and I sure enough, I don't see any, any plants whatsoever. Okay. All right. I'll check into that. that. doesn't mean you can't put them in. Exactly. Yeah, well, exactly. That's, that's what, that's what they're looking for. Okay. I, I will clarify and send out an email and let you know. So, so that's another comment on that. Mm -hmm. Um, it's pretty much impossible to get a picture of an <laughs> animal. It's true. A lizard, maybe, uh, you know, 
those I'll little animals are scurrying away. So I tell you what, maybe, you see, see. maybe you'd see a chipmunk and a eastern fox squirrel and you know interesting animals, but you could never post them on iNaturalist because you wouldn't have a picture. You don't have you, you, you don't have to have a picture to post. Right. You can post observations without a, a photo. Okay. Also, you can use a camera with uh, a long lens and then download it on your computer and then get it over to Dude, I, I posted it. All right. <laughs> you can Susie Leslie, it. Last fall, Susie Leslie was interested in, you know, how long, how late into the season monarchs, we were seeing monarchs in Blacksburg because we were talking about when to cut down weedy fields and that kind of thing. And I I posted lots of monarch observations and just said what I was seeing. I didn't have a picture of them. Okay. Well, I'll get some clarification on the, the iNaturalist thing because um, I'm confused now too. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll check and I'll let you guys know once I hear back. That would, um, that would be a good way to enlist an assistant is ask for somebody who's got a good camera and good photography skills sure. to, come along to do that. Go, Reinhardt. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to keep you busy. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. <laughs> okay, so you um, guys. Some of the busy. wildlife, though, like the vernal pool obligates, mm -hmm. I don't want people to know where they are. Because there are people that go out there and collect them. Okay, don't post them. So I don't post pictures of them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Use, use your judgment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, if you can, any if other you don't feel questions? Posting something, don't. Yeah, I agree. Right. I agree. Um, any other questions that you have you think of later? shoot me an email. Um, I'm going to be talking with um, Megan at DWR sometime in the next couple of weeks, I think. So if you have something you'd like to ask her, um, let me know. And, um, you know, as far as when to start your first observation, when to go for your first site visit, whenever it works for you. Um, I know that the spring visiting time ends June 30th. If you can get it in before then, great. But if not, I totally understand and just try to hit the next one in you know July to September. So I'm leaving it up to you, you know, especially this first one because I know that people are busy in the summer or travel, or whatever. So um, just get started when you can and um, send me questions when you have them and I will get a clarification on the iNaturalist stuff. One last question that'll happen is if yeah. we have people join us on this, mm -hmm. will this be counted as volunteer hours for them? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So it's volunteer hours for you and for people who join. So it's, okay. it's a great opportunity for people to get some volunteer hours. Yep. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Oh, babe, hey, before we go, I, it didn't get sent out the way I hoped, but there's a, the mosquito, Chloe Lahendra, who talked with us, needs mm -hmm. some other yards to set up their mosquito collecting uh, that, her, that, that her people do. She needs to know by the 11th. So if there's anyone who would like to volunteer their yards, uh, some young people come out a couple times a week and set up a little thing under a shrub somewhere and they come and go without bothering you. And they collect okay. up the mosquitoes and analyze their guts. Barb, you can give her my name. Oh, I'll do it. Okay, yeah. I'll yeah. do it. How, how far do we want to go? I don't know, Chris, but I don't think Rich Creek is on the list, but I'm gonna say that. I'm gonna ask. If, if Christiansburg's on there, you can give him my name too. Okay, yeah, it's really this. fun to do. I've done it. I, they didn't do it last summer because of COVID, but the year before they collected in the gar in my garden. I had the first mosquitoes of the season the year before last. The Ooh. honor I, I carry so proudly. <laughs> All right. Have a good evening, everyone. Thanks. Bye.